Yeah, I, I made you the host. Oh, so that's now fine. I can't support it. Um, awesome. I think so it's. We, I think it started. Oh yeah, I see that now. Great. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, at least virtually, uh, with you all. I wish I could be be there in uh, in person. Um, again, my name is Laura Crawford. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research and this is a professor of biostatistics at Brown University. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you a, a lot about my uh, research program, broadly speaking, of this idea of, you, of building variable selection and interpretability into black box statistical models. Um, and so uh, I'd like to kind of give a little background on my research programs uh, just to kind of introduce people who may not uh, be aware of what we do. You know, I'm a statistician by training. I was co-advised by someone in pharmacology cancer biology at Duke. Um, and so I, I, my research program kind of sits at the intersection of, of um, computation and, and more genomic principles. And I like to say, tell people is that, you know, I'm not a statistician that just builds really fancy hammers and goes, looks for nails. I actually really care about specific biological questions. And so my lab likes to think about how we can make a real impact on, on specific uh, 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 things happening in, in different areas of genetics and genomics. Um, you know, I, a, a large part about things that we do, broadly speaking, is this idea of modeling variation across complex traits. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit of one aspect that we do, but I, I never want to leave out the other part of my research program, which is, you know, studying variation, not, a, not just across phenotypes like height, body mass index, and things like that, but also across things like shapes. So uh, differences of bird beaks across different uh, uh, different species or, or uh, on the right hand side, you see different morphology of heel bones for different primates. Um, and so the large part of the idea of modeling variation of complex traits, how I look at it is this idea of dissecting phenotypic variation into different uh, components. And so, you know, I think about phenotypic variation as being this entire pie where that pie is made up of both genetic and environmental type effects. All right, and we can break down the, the, um, the genetic component into both uh, things that are driven by additive effects. So this idea of gene A's effects plus gene B and then nonlinear effects. So this idea of gene A times the effect of gene B or even on uh, a gene by environmental effects. So how a gene interacts with, with one's environment. Um, in genetics, I think about this phenomenon called epistasis as my nonlinear component here. So that G by gene effect. But again, there are other areas of genomics that my lab also thinks about, which is how genomics might interact with things like tumor microenvironment and, and other kind of phenomena. And so today we're going to focus on, on, on statistical genetics a little bit. And so a, a big data description for, for the things that we do is, you know, I can think about my trait of interest being some uh, uh, continuous vector, this Y variable, and Y could be anything like crop yield, um, height. Um, and then our X matrix, our, our, our uh, data, or features of interest are going to be, in this case, SNPs. Um, and so here we'll have an N by P matrix um, where all of my entries are encoded as 0, 1, or 2 uh, based on minor allele frequency. Um, all the models that, we can, that we're going to present today can also be thinking about in genomics contests. So you're not limited for your genotypes just being SNP chip data. They can also be you know, gene expression via RNA-seq or something like that. Um, but it's still going to have this like high dimensional setting where we have more uh, more features than, than samples. And so in genetics, you know, linear models are uh, uh, typically uh, the thing that are used for this idea of trait mapping, right? And so um, I like to show this slide as taking us back to kind of stat 101 is to kind of show uh, this idea that what we're basically doing is, you know, regressing our genotype um, onto our, our phenotype of interest. And what I really like to do is show that these ideas of linear regression is you get these nice betas, right? So uh, these betas are these vectors, right? Where uh, the beta, if I estimate these betas, they can lend some kind of notion of association for a given loci J and how it might relate to our phenotype, right? And so if I fit things like in linear least, or, or ordinary least squares or something like that, I get these beta hats, right? These estimates of betas. And then I can go back and do what we call hypothesis testing to understand how significant that, that given effect is in terms of explaining the variation of my trait, right? And once I have these p-values, I can now go in and identify where these detected associations might, might lie genomically. And so here we have a Manhattan plot where I have, you know, 22 chromosomes on the x-axis. You know, and I can take the log transform p-values on my y-axis and I can identify where spikes in a given region might occur 
uh, and, and then do further investigation and say, where well, a spike in that region might be an enrichment in that given position. And I can go look and see, okay, which genes might also lie in, that, in those genomic positions and then you know, do further downstream tests. Now that's linear regression. Well, my, my lab likes to think of things from a non-additive perspective. And so we work with a lot of like machine learning algorithms. And as a lot of us are kind of aware, machine learning algorithms are typically well-suited for prediction-based tasks, right? Now, unfortunately, uh, the, the caveat to these algorithms, a lot of times they're referred to as black box. And what I mean by black box is I have some input variable that comes into this box. And then I have some output of a nice prediction but in terms of my understanding of what's happening in the contents of this black box, meaning how maybe uh, my features are being upweighted or downweighted to give me the really nice predictions, that understanding is a little hazy, right? And so a big research goal of mine is to provide interpretable ways to summarize the importance of input variables into these kind of non-parametric machines, right? And in this talk, we're gonna think about inputs being genotypes and our outputs being different genotypes, right? Now, the, to get a little bit of terms of the convention, so, you know, linear models uh, only see a portion of that overall phenotypic variance I was talking about, right, because they're, they're linear and additive in nature, uh, while black box models kind of see the entire piece of the pie. Um, the, the caveat, though, is that, right, linear models have interpretability because I get that notion of effect size on the left, whereas black box models, I don't have that, right? And so what I try to do in my research program is work in, with really nice predictive models on the right while being able to figure out how to have interpretability that we might get on the left, right? Almost like this whole idea of having the best of both worlds. One way to kind of mention this in terms of conventional wisdoms for those people who might be in statistics is this idea that smooth nonlinear functions are often more predictive than linear ones, um, but variable selection is much easier in linear regression. Right? And if I were to take that and transform that to something we might say in genetics, you know, nonlinear models are, are better for genomic selection, i.e. phenotypic prediction, uh, but linear models are much more well suited for things like GWAS and QTO mapping based studies. And so when I think of what makes an interpretable model, I think of these things having three components. The, the, the first being that I have a motivating probabilistic model. The second is that I have a notion of effect size or regression coefficient for each of my features, like a weight for each of my features. And the third is that I have a statistical metric that kind of summarizes how each of these markers are significant, right? What I actually add to the third part is that we want a statistical metric that can be significant according to some like null hypothesis, right? So that's a key part that separates what we do in ge genetics is that there's some idea of what happens in the case that there is no genetic signal, right? So these three components are what we consider to, to make up, what I consider to make up an interpretable model. And so in this talk, I'm going to kind of give you uh, two ways that, that, that achieving those three uh, uh, ingredients are, are possible, right? And the first is this idea of a post hoc approach. And this is very simple. I fit a very complex model to my data, and then I go back after my data is fit and then try to figure out what that model learned. Right, And so uh, in the first part of this talk, we'll talk about how to define an effect size analog for nonlinear models. I'll talk about this cool alternative way to figure out how uh, each feature might be significant in the context of these nonlinear models. And then I'll show you how this works in simulations and real data. Um, and then the second half of the talk, I'll, I'll give it an alternative way to define interpretability. And here what we're gonna do is we're gonna leverage this idea that we have uh, biological annotations or, or knowledge about biological systems for which we can then self superimpose into our models to make interpret to interpretability, right? So here I'm gonna give this notion of neural networks that are where their architectures are governed by things that we know to be realistic in the literature. And so I'll introduce this idea of biologically annotated neural networks. I'll talk about how we fit these networks and I'll give some simulations and some method comparisons and, and a real data analysis example at the end. So let's, let's go to the first part. Let's talk about post hoc uh, uh, approaches. So, um, you know, in the first couple slides, what I showed is that, you know, linear models are, are better for trade mapping. And I showed you this idea of a Y equals this X beta term, right? Plus some, some error, so some error noise. Let's relax this idea of needing uh, an additive relationship between my genotypes and their effects. And let's say that instead now, I have some phenotype of interest Y, and its relationship to my genotypes is, is based on some nonlinear transformation, right? Um, so we'll, we'll relax that, X, that F of X term and we'll have, uh, well, that X beta term, and we'll have just a function here. 
I'm going to model this function via what we call a Gaussian process. So I'm put a, a prior over the function space, meaning that the relationship between X and some genotype and my, my output phenotype can be of any kind of form. And I'll put a prior over the different forms that that can take, right? And so again, XIRMR genotypes of interest, that M term in my GP is called a mean function. For the sake of this talk, let's assume that that mean function is set to zero. The K is going to be our covariance function, or, or you can think about this as like a similarity measure. Um, and, and one way to consider what the overall covariance of the structure is going to be is K can be some nonlinear metric that defines how in a nonlinear way the genotypes of each of my patients or each of my samples are related to each other. So I get this large covariance matrix, which is very similar to a genetic relatedness matrix that we see everywhere in genetics, except each of the entries aren't based on additive relationships. They're based on some nonlinear function like a Gaussian kernel or something for which I predefined, right? And that's going to specify this nonlinear uh, uh, version of, of my f of x. Okay. Now, what's really cool in this space is we have this thing called the kernel trick, right? So once I define my kernel function for which I want to compare genotypes to each other, what that kind of what that does is allow me now to map from a high dimensional um, input space to an n dimensional n being the number of observation function space. Okay, and what we know is that in my n dimensional nonlinear function space, I can do really cool, really nice predictions, right? I get really nice predictive power on the right hand side. Now in biology, a lot of times we don't want to just know like uh, how we, how how what our, what our good predictions are we want to know how we're making these good predictions right we want to know which SNPs, which genes are at were most at play for us to make uh, a prediction of risk or or, or um, understanding variation of our trait the unfortunate part about this kernel trick is there's no way to kind of once i fit this nonlinear model uh in in its right form go back to understand how my uh gaussian process upweighted or downweighted these nonlinear these uh these input features uh, in order to make a really uh, accurate prediction for some phenotype. And so from a classic example, uh, the, the classic idea of variable selection is lost once I kind of make this transformation. And so I have a GP, I have a motivating probabilistic model, but the, the idea of uh, the second step is how do I get in the uh, notion of the effect size once I fit this GP model to my uh, genotypic data? And so let's take another step back to, to linear models 101. And so I'm going to kind of show you this in, in uh, uh, juxtaposed across each other so you can kind of see the difference. You know, in linear models, um, I, I have a linear regression model at the top. The way I estimate an effect size is I basically project my phenotype of interest onto the column space of my data, right? And in least squares, we, we use uh, a generalized inverse to do this, right? broadly speaking. And that's going to give me my beta hat. With those beta hats, I then test, um, I create z-scores, I can, I can derive p-values, right? I can take those beta hats and do predictions out of sample. Those beta hats are really big in terms of interpretability, right? Now, for my effect size analog for nonlinear models, I can do the same exact thing, but you can see on the right-hand side, I've relaxed this idea of having x beta um, relationship. Now I just have my nonlinear function f. And to create my effect size analog, what I'm going to do is instead of projecting y onto the column space of x, I'm going to project my smooth nonlinear function f onto the column space of x. And I can define this projection any way I want. For the sake of comparison, let's say that this projection is the same generalized inverse that I was going to use for like the least squares, right? Now I have now I have these kind of beta tildes. Now these beta tildes are not exactly like the beta hats because they're derived in a, in a different fashion. But these beta tildes can still serve as weights for my input variables. Okay, so in practice, let me show you how this works. Um, I went to Duke, so I'm a, a um, inherently Bayesian, maybe you can say. Uh, so let's say I set up my model. I have a, a nice GP. Let's say I set up like some uh, MCMC to estimate the the parameters in my model. What's really nice is once I define a projection function, I can use that to deterministically identify what an observation of my beta tildes would be. So anytime I sample a new version of f, I get a new, I can implicitly determine what my beta tilde estimate would have been for my input features. Okay. Now with these beta tildes, I can do anything I want, right? I can, I can now decide if I want to do prediction with them, right? There, there are these weights that I can use. Okay. 
Now, let me kind of show you how this works really quickly in a genomic selection example of these beta tildes to, to convince you that they're actually doing what I want them to do in terms of both capturing um, some effects that my, that my GP learned. Um, let's, let's look at data from the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. Here, I'm gonna have approximately 2,000 mice. Again, uh, for these data sets, these are, are gonna have I'm 129 different traits. These traits are gonna be broken down into these six different groups. Um, what I love about this data set is uh, these, each phenotype in these different uh, categories have different non-additive um, architectural uh, contributions into the variation of, of these architectures. And so what you'll see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in this data set. So you can really get the, a good idea of how uh, advantageous a nonlinear model might be versus like a more linear regression uh, type of framework. So what we're going to do is we're going to pair a GP and these effect size analogs against um, a few linear models and a support vector machine to be our baseline for a nonlinear model. Okay, we're going to perform these like 80-20 out of sample splits, and I'm going to use mean squared error as my uh, as my loss to determine how well a, a model is doing in terms of prediction. Okay. So across all 129 different traits, here's the overall mean squared error across all of them. As you can see, the SVM and the um, GP plus my effect size analog do quite well, right? In terms of uh, doing prediction out of sample versus these um, other linear models. This is a nice view, but I think a more comprehensive view is if you were to see all 129 traits together. Um, and so one way to kind of look at this is each trait individually. So here, what I've done is I, I have all 129 traits laid out. The mean squared error is on the on the y-axis, um, and I broke them down into the different uh, categories that you see. And what you can note, kind of notice, is that red line is where the Gaussian process is kind of tracking at the bottom. The purple line, where the red line is kind of overlaid, is the is the support vector machine. And you can see they kind of track really nicely together these nonlinear models. And you can see there's much more heterogeneity in performance. For the linear models, kind of uh, much above that, kind of sprinkled at the top, right? Kind of, they kind of dip in performance for certain models, or for certain for certain traits. What we can do for each of these traits is say, okay, well, how much of this is driven by non-additive variation, right? So I could take each of these traits and I can do a variance component analysis to say, okay, how much of this is driven by additivity for a given trait? How much of this is driven by um, non-additivity, so non-genetic additivity, and how much of this is driven by common environmental interactions, right? And so we did this for each of these 129 different traits. And here's the result that you get. So you can see non-additive variation uh, going back to like my pi idea of all summing up to one. And you can see on, the, on each of these rows, at the top I have additive effects. On the second row, I have uh, pairwise interactions. So gene A times gene B. Uh, the third row, I have third order effects. And the last row, we have these common environmental effects that happen because of the way that these mice were bred in cages. And you can see across all these, all these different traits, uh, very rarely does additivity actually dominate the architecture for any of the given phenotypes, right? In fact, in some of these phenotypes, uh, like for hematology and others, you know, third order effects like dominate the, the architecture that we're seeing. And so this is a really uh, interesting plot because it kind of serves as a, a motivation for why non-additive models might be useful in, in um, some of these cases. And so the effect size analog gives me a weight after I fit a nonlinear GP to my data. So what that does is it satisfies my second point. I now have a motivating probabilistic model. I now have a notion of effect size. But the issue with these weights is they don't give me this idea of a statistical metric for, to summarize significance, right? I can't just take these weights and take the, the magnitude of them to rank how important one variable is versus another, right? I also can't derive p-values with them because uh, I don't have standard errors, really. I, I can't really derive base factors or posterior inclusion probabilities with them. So they're just weights. So they need something else to make them useful. So recently what we did is we thought about a way to, an alternative way to think about variable selection that could be generalizable across all, uh, across many different, both linear and non-linear uh, methodologies. And so hear me out, we're gonna take a step away from genetics real quick and we're gonna go to uh, sports because I like sports a lot. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a basketball team, um, any team in the world, and let's say that this basketball team is a network. Like as a whole, they uh, they have some amount of information. Okay, now if I wanted to rank characters in my data set, what I would do is I would say I'm going to put one of these players on injury reserve. So let's say I take number thirty in the corner and I say, how important is number thirty relative to the rest of my team? 
If I put number 30 on injury reserve, what might happen is I might lose some information, right? Based on number 30 not playing, but maybe not a lot, right? In other words, the team might still might have lost some of its talent, but maybe the rest of the talent as a whole, the information as a whole allows them to still win a lot of games, okay? Well, let's say I take another random player, anyone on the team, and let's say that he decides he's going to go shoot Space Jam or he's going to go play baseball now. What now what might happen is I might lose a lot more information with that individual not playing than I did with number 30, right? And I can measure that distance between what happened with the full team was around with that full team, with that one, with the team, with that player being on injury reserve. Now, if I wanted to understand the ranking of all my players in my data set, what I could do is I could take that measure and do that by iteratively placing every single player on my team on injury reserve and then measuring that distance. Well, it turns out you can mathematically represent this via KL divergences, right? So the, the way I can summarize the influence of any one of my given SNPs or genes on the rest of the SNPs and genes in my data set is by measuring the KL divergence bet difference between the full distribution with that gene's effect having been marginalized over, and then the conditional distribution with me having set that gene's effect to zero, right? The idea of putting that player on injury reserve. Right. And so another way to think about this is the KL divergence is zero, meaning that is it can be interpreted as that variable is not a key explanatory variable relative to the others. Right. In other words, the KL divergence between those two distributions is zero if and only if they're exactly the same. Whether that player is around or whether that player's effect is, is, is set to zero, it doesn't matter. Like I still have the same amount of information. Okay. Now, uh, what we do in this, in this data set is we uh, determine significance by exploring a variable's relative centrality. So what that means is I take all my KL divergences de uh, derived from all of my SNPs in my data set, and I scale them by the sum of their totals, right? And that gives me a really cool and interesting null hypothesis. Remember, I said this idea of determining significance based on a null. So the null hypothesis for these rate measures in, in terms of sports is that um, under the null, all of my players um, explain the same amount of information, right? Another analogy is that I have nothing but bench players on my team, no stars, right? The alternative is that some variables, some SNPs, some genes explain much more variation relative to others, right? In other words, I have a few stars in the bunch, right? So let me show you how this works again in practice via simulations really quick as a, as a uh, proof of concept. Let's say I simulate data here from 2000 samples and 25 genetic markers, okay? Um, I'm gonna choose the last three genetic markers to be my causal variables. You can think about those as being my Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman. Um, and what I'm gonna do then is consider different architecture for those three variables. So one of these three variables have an effect and the rest of the variables don't, okay? What we're gonna do is I'm gonna fit a Gaussian process and I'm going to then derive an effect size analog and then run rate on those effect size analogs to then rank the variable importance for each of these uh, uh, features, okay? So when I do that, here's your result. So on the, on the x-axis, we have each of our features. On the y-axis, we have that rate-like measure. Um, and the, the, that red dashed line is that one over P line I was talking about. That's the line that represents what would have happened if I had simulated my data from like just noise, right? If I had no stars on the team, okay? So as you can see, I, I identified Jordan, Pippen, and Robin as being my most important players, okay? Now, the, the question here becomes, okay, what, what is this idea of centrality? So what we can do to kind of estimate what, or, or um, to, to demonstrate what I mean by centrality is say, what if I take, uh, Jordan, for instance, the most important player, I, I set his effect to zero, and then I iteratively, um, I iteratively uh, also set everyone else's effect to zero with his, right? So everyone on my team is going to be set to zero with Jordan's being set to zero all the time. So what I do is I basically remove Jordan's effect from the data set, I rerun rate onto my effect sizes, and we are my features, and what you can see is I get a new set of rankings, right? Jordan and Pippen, or sorry, Pippen and Robin are still my most important players without Jordan around, right? They're clearly, the, they're still the two stars. But what you can see is that the, the relative centrality of all my other variables has gone up, but they've gone up uniformly, right? As an analogy, that's like saying I've lost 40 points a game 
So that responsibility of making up those 40 points have to come on someone, right? But it's gonna rely on everyone else kind of equally because each of these variables are effectively just noise, right? What I can do again to kind of explore this uh, 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 situation further is I can set Jordan and Pippin out together. And so Robin is the only star left. What you can see is Robin is still identified and you can see everyone else kind of hovers more closely uniformly around this one over P line. I could, do, I could take uh, uh, Dennis Robin also out of the game and then I'm just left with a bunch of bench players. You can see everyone kind of hovers over this one over P line. Okay. Um, a proof of concept of this would also be uh, to as a sanity check and say, okay, what if I had run my original data set, but I ended up setting uh, number 30's effect to zero instead of anyone else's? Well, you can see nothing really happens. Everyone kind of is still identified the way they should be, right? Um, another alternative would have been, okay, what if I simulated data against noise? You can kind of see everyone kind of hovers around this one over P line. Now this, this, this variable selection metric is not perfect. And I, I want to also get to that. But before I do, let me show you how this works in, in real data. Then I'll kind of talk about the pros and cons of this particular approach. Okay. So let's go back to our mouse data set. Um, again, from the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics, same setup. Out of these 129 different traits though, I'm just gonna study HDL for, the, for demonstration. What I want you to see is how, if I were to do like genome-wide association study with the GP and rate, how that would how that would compare against if I had done like a single SNP GWAS test, like we typically do in, in association studies. Okay, so the single SNP GWAS test is strictly linear association, it's a, a marginal association at that. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to create two Manhattan plots here. On the top is the GP plus the rate example. Uh, what you can see is uh, on the y-axis is the rate measure, while on the uh, y-axis for, for panel B is the negative log transform P values. Again, we have our chromosomes and our in the x-axis. Stars that have been annotated across this, uh, across the genome are places where there are um, findings that have been um, uh, validated in, in external studies. Um, and you can see there are certain areas like on chromosome one where there's a nice agreement between what the GP identifies and also what uh, uh, the single SNP model identifies. But there are other areas, for instance, on chromosome 11 and 12 where there are actually been identified as being non-additive variation playing a large role in these traits that the single SNP model just misses. Okay? So there is kind of some uh, uh, notion here that the GP is really nice. Now, the problem with rate is that it's not effective for every type of genome-wide association study, right? Uh, that one over P line becomes not that effective when there are many, many SNPs in your data set. So here we have 10,000 uh, variants. It's, that's not a lot to, to, uh, to work with. That's, that's not a huge number that, that you have to work with. And that one over P line still sort of means anything. But as P tracks towards, like, say, a million, and, and towards infinity, one over P becomes basically zero. And they're calling all variants as being uh, statistically uh, uh, important in terms of your trait. So there is this kind of sweet spot for which an idea like rate in terms of information measure types uh, effectively works, right? It only kind of works in these sweet spots where you don't have massively large data sets. The other problem with rate is in some cases, this idea of the null hypothesis isn't well suited for, for all tasks. And so thinking really clearly of where this one over P task is, is, is useful is, is a big thing, right? The last thing being computation, you know, you have to fit this KL divergence for every variant in your data set. For 10,000 SNPs, that's not, a, that's not that bad. For 50,000 SNPs even, it's not, it's not awful. But fitting that KL divergence, which, which has to deal with, there are some matrix inversions and things like that, um, that can get really uh, uh, quite computationally intensive. For a million SNPs, say for like the UK Biobank, that becomes a bit of an issue. So there's not, there, there are some issues where this kind of model could kind of work, right? But this is an ex example of where like a post hoc type of method um, could be useful, right? And so what rate kind of does kind of completes these three components um, from a post hoc perspective. Now, what, what I started recognizing when we really started working on this was, uh, this, this method's not perfect, right? Um, and so they really motivated me to think about are there other ways to enforce interpretability on our models um, in, in a way that maybe doesn't have to deal with these post hoc measures and maybe it could be more like what we traditionally do um, in other areas of genetics. 
And so that brought me to this idea of using neural networks um, uh, with architectures that are governed by, by biology. Um, and this is joint work between both my uh, students at Brown and some of the RAs that we have at MSR, but it, which has been uh, pretty fun to kind of mesh those two worlds. Um, and so uh, the, you can think about probabilistic neural networks for those who may not be aware, you know, typically these are done with the, what we call uh, uh, fully connected architectures, right? So I have some input layer um, X, uh, with some features X1 and X2. Um, each of these have weights that are connected to some nodes in my hidden layer. Um, these, these are denoted by H1, H2, H3 with corresponding weights that are denoted by these thetas. Um, and then these hidden layers can kind of feed into this, this thing about this as a shallow model out into my output layer with their own set of weights. Um, and what's really cool about neural networks is I can kind of write this like a nonlinear regression model, right? My phenotype of interest Y is some transformation of this output layer. Um, in the case of regression, that sigma is just the identity. And my function is just like a, a linear combination of my hidden neurons and their corresponding weights plus some like bias terms, right? And so if I wanted to, I could make this model Bayesian in a way, and I could fit rate to uh, this model if I, if, to a neural network if I really wanted to, like, like these papers at the bottom cited uh, do. Alternatively, what I could do is think about a way to kind of manipulate this architecture to give me more interpretability um, from the very beginning. Right. And so one thing that we could all think about is this idea that there are high, there's a hierarchical nature to enrichment studies. Right. So let's let's take a, a Manhattan plot again. Uh, the uh, y axis here is going to be posterior inclusion probability. So on a Bayesian scale, probabilities of inclusion for any given use SNPs, same kind of interpretation, a spike means enrichment at that given location. Um, each dot here is going to be a particular variant. What's really cool about uh, enrichment studies is that I know that for a given SNP, I can also annotate these locations for given genes. So I know that a gene is located in this given genomic region, right? And so I kind of say, I have this kind of nice idea of SNPs feeding into genes, right? And then if I wanted to get a little higher, I know what genes are annotated for given pathways or biological processes, right? The, the, the cool thing about this is it's kind of really nice. It kind of sets me up with this kind of information that feeds into itself where I know I have a list of genes at the top. I know that which chromosome each gene is on. And I know the start and end positions for like the boundary for that given gene. And so I also know which SNPs fall within on that chromosome also within that boundary, right? And so I have a predefined gene or pathway annotation list and I can use information from that list to inform my network architecture. So stay with me a little bit. Um, I, I can take this Manhattan plot where again, SNPs are feeding into genes. And if I just rotate this thing onto its axis, it looks like a neural network, right? Where um, now in my partially connected structure, I have, a, I have SNPs for variants and I limit the connections that I make in my hidden neurons, right? So, in, in this diagram, only SNPs that are that have been annotated for the same gene are connected in terms of their connections from the first layer, the input layer, into the hidden layer. And if I could do that for every gene or every set of SNPs across the genome, what that does is it gives me an interpret interpretation of my hidden layer. My hidden layer is not some random hidden layer anymore. Now my hidden layer neurons are annotated as genes or SNP sets or pathways or proteins, depending on how I did this annotation, right? And then I can have my hidden layer feed out into my, my phenotype of interest, or I can go higher in genomic scale if I want to make the model deeper, right? So that's the idea of biologically annotated neural networks or, or bands as we call it, is this idea of using predefined knowledge to then limit our uh, our understanding of uh, the way that we want our models to actually learn uh, these different relationships, right? So bands is really simple and it's really generalizable actually. So what you do is you start off in, in panel A, you start with a set of SNP sets. These SNP sets can be uh, uh, located on single chromosomes or cross chromosomes. And the point is that you know this genomic start and end positions that, that this SNP set covers, and you know the set of SNPs that are in that given boundary, right? What you can do is you can take that kind of architecture and articulate it in terms of what a neural network looks like. 
So here I only let the SNPs that have been annotated for the same SNP set be, be connected in the, in the, to nodes corresponding in the hidden neuron or hidden layer. Right. So then I have a nice understanding of from SNP to SNP set to phenotype, phenotypic layer. Okay. And then what I can do is I can, I can be really creative for how I model things. Right. So now I have this nice architecture of a hierarchical way of how SNPs feed into genes, how genes feed into pathways, how pathways feed into my phenotype. Um, and I can start to manipulate my model based on how I think effects are manifested at different genomic scales. Right. So what do I mean by that? So let's say I had a model, I had a phenotype that I thought was sparse. Right. I could, I were meaning that I only had, I only imagined that I had SNP effects that are on or off. What I can do is I can set priors of my, on my weights that say, you either have a spike in slab prior, you're either on or off based on my preconceived idea of how SNP effects are distributed for that phenotype. If I think there might be a little bit more nuance to the way SNP effects are, are are uh, generated, meaning that SNP effects might be uh, either associated, spurious, uh, or you might have these non-associated non effects, meaning I have large, intermediate, small type of effects. I can model things more as a mixture, right? And that's what you're seeing here. So I can, I can take this and start to implement this into the way I derive my model. So I have my full model specification, and the real, uh, the real flexibility you have is how you model or how you assume prior specifications to be on the weight. So my SNP effects, I, my SNP set effects, I can give a certain on or off feel to them. My SNP level effects, I can have more flexibility depending on how complicated uh, their architecture is. And that really gives me really nice freedom as, as a modeler to figure out how I, I want to, to um, do my association mapping. Um, Again, BANS is also really flexible just as a framework. This can work for individual level data for which I have access to individual level genomes. This can also work if I just have access to, to summary statistics. So here, instead of having SNPs leading to genes, let's say I just have access to effect sizes from a previous study, and I have just access to a reference panel LD matrix, I can do the same type of modeling even in this BANS framework. Here now I have my, my LD matrix be uh, the inputs to my model, and I try to regress that onto my uh, 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 effect size estimate of summary statistic of interest. Um, and then again, I can still set priors in a way that I think are, are reasonable for these different level of effects. Right. Um, and if you also want to think about how to extend this on the phenotypic side, you know, BANS is also useful for modeling multiple phenotypes at a time. Um, so here's an extension of BANS where I'm not just going to leverage uh, the, uh, the correlation across genotypes, and maybe I have correlation across multiple phenotypes that I also want to take advantage of. I can model multiple phenotypes in this kind of uh, nice joint model as well with this architecture. Um, so the, the key crux here about how you do uh, selection in, in, this, in this model is, you know, we use a variational uh, EM algorithm, which is not perfect, and I could talk about a little bit about that at, uh, when I show my next couple slides. Um, the key, though, is uh, with these sparse priors, you know, posterior mean for, for weights of non-associated SNPs and SNP sets trend towards zero, right? So if I learn things that are not associated, those get shrunken down to zero, and so I'm only list, left with seeing um, the relevant weights that matter, right? um, And the key thing here is I can derive posterior inclusion probabilities. So these are the things that allow me to do my variable selection. In, the, in, my, in my three component uh, ingredients for an interpretable model, you know, that gives me this, the, the nice summary significance metric that I can use to then follow up to figure out which SNPs are more important or which SNP sets are more important than others, right? And I can do this at both levels simultaneously, both on the input layer as well as the hidden layers. And so BANS also gives me my three components of a, pro, of a interpretable model just in a totally different way, right? I have a nice motivating problem with models and neural network. My notion of effect size stems from this idea that I'm doing this partial connection where every single weight in my model means something, right? This is the weight for SNP1, this is the weight for SNP set one. Um, and then the posterior enclosure probabilities give me a nice statistical metric that I can summarize my markers and things with. Um, so let me show you how this will work really quickly in, in uh, simulations, and then hopefully I can get to uh, talk about some of the other kind of cool stuff that my lab is doing. Um, so here we're going to focus on chromosome one from individuals of European ancestry just for simulation purposes. Um, here we have about 350,000 individuals. On chromosome one, we have about 36,000, 37,000 SNPs. Um, 
Each of these SNPs are gonna be annotated based on this RefSeq database uh, for 1900 genes. We also consider um, intergenic regions between these gene annotations as also SNP sets. So you can take that number and, and, and double it. Um, and we're gonna assume uh, to have a, a broad sense heritability of, of just uh, 0.6. Um, in this paper, there are about like 65 pages of supplementals. And so if you're curious to see how uh, other thing, you know, other scenarios might work, uh, we might, we probably cover them somewhere in the paper. Um, and this is just for demonstration. Um, and our results here are gonna be simulated, are based on how to simulate data sets. So the cool thing about, about bands is, in, in terms of our evaluation, is if bands is doing what it's supposed to do, it should be competitive at both ranking SNPs effectively and ranking SNP sets effectively. So when we compare it against these different models, we compare it against models on, on both scales. Okay, um, We compare it against multiple architectures in this paper. Um, sparse, for those who may not be aware, is this idea of only have a few SNPs that cor correspond to, the, to affecting uh, the phenotype of interest. You can, and polygenic means I have a, have a bunch. Um, you can think about why sparse is easier than, than polygenic in terms of simulation scenarios. If you go back to my pie example, in the sparse case, let's say I only have 10 SNPs. In my pie example, that's like me dividing that pie into only 10 slices. So each effect of a given SNP in terms of its contribution to that variance is quite large, right? Let's, then the polygenic case, say I take that pie and now I divide it up into a thousand little slices, the effect size for every single SNP gets much smaller. So our ability to identify SNPs um, in the polygenic case is just a harder setting. And you can see how our model compares against these uh, different state-of-the-art mapping approaches on, on the right-hand side. We can then think about the same kind of architecture in the context of, of um, uh, gene SNP sets. And so our, our finding, identifying core genes in, in our simulation scenarios. Um, again, the same kind of idea works in the sparse and uh, polygenic architecture, you can see how robust the, the bands models are um, in this particular scenario. You know, one thing about bands that we're trying to figure out how to do better is get it to run for, uh, is proving the runtime over, uh, for like much larger data sets than what we considered, um, thinking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of individuals with, with uh, millions of SNPs. And so that is a limitation right now in terms of uh, the way that the model is currently coded. Um, this this model is yeah. Lauren, yeah. Lauren uh, this is Nancy. I'm sorry Hi. for interrupting. I was no. since you were talking about the since you were talking about the computation, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, since you were talking about the uh, computational aspect of this band, can I ask you one thing about the um, the way you uh, uh, computed the maximum likelihood estimators, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. for the SNPs. So you effectively have a uh, neural network, right? Mm -hmm. um, but instead of using the sort of, you know, uh, the back propagation, uh, you went with a 40 Bayesian framework yeah. and um, went with the EM. Now, uh, do you run into the same uh, optimization issues as, you know, the uh, by using, by choosing the EM algorithm to, um, to do the optimization, do you um, circumvent some of the optimization issues and you know, how close to, are you to getting to the actual we, global optimal? We, we circumvent some and then we create new ones. Um, so it's my long story answer to that. So some of that we circumvent is that we're able, um, so we, we get really nice convergence for, for this model um, by using this variational EM type of thing where we were seeing convergence issues where we try to run things with black box optimizers. Um, one thing that the variation of MEM is not good at is specifically on this slide in particular, and two things. One is um, for, for uh, the black box optimizers were much more robust in performance to, across traits. They weren't, they weren't optimal, but, they, but you saw more robustness across them. Um, so, so one setting here is um, the estimation of the weights themselves when the architecture in the variational EM is uh, simplistic, meaning I just have additive traits and that additive architecture is sparse, the variational EM does a really good job of recapitulating or recapturing and estimating those weights that generated that model. When I start to, and this you can see this here when we estimate heritability um, across these traits, these simulated traits, when I start to add, um, um, more uh, complexity to them, meaning I add um, nonlinear interactions 
or I make the trait polygenic. We, as you can see here, we start to, uh, there's like this under bias, that thing that happens where we, uh, we start to underestimate these weights in the model. So the variation of EM is mm -hmm. subject to that. The other thing that is subject to is in practice, the EM obviously is an approximation for some of these more Bayesian type of ideas. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. behave like a spike and slab prior and fully Bayesian models do. Instead, it behaves closer mm -hmm. to like a lasso. So if you have two highly correlated SNPs, um, what the variational EM algorithm is going to do is it's going to prioritize one over the other, even in the case where they're both mm -hmm. causal, right? It's going to be I like, it's going to be like the see. lasso. The lasso is going to choose one of those solutions versus the other one. The bears that you have for the spike and slabs them do something very similar. Whereas what a, what a purely Bayesian mm -hmm. model would have done, right, is taking that pro pro inclusion probability and spread it nicely across those correlated mm -hmm. steps. The variation of algorithm mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. And so there are some negative things to it. The other thing that we saw was that I'm the, the uh, black box optimizer was better at a predictive task than the variational EM mm -hmm. because of these, mm -hmm. uh, because it's able to identify weight combinations that'll generalize to other phenotype, other other uh, genotypes within a given ancestry than than uh, mm -hmm. the variational EM did because of this underweighting problem that ends up happening. I see. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, great. So I guess I'm running out of time. So I'll just go these really quickly in terms of uh, real data stuff. So in the real data example here, uh, we, we focus on uh, two studies, Framingham Heart Study uh, and the UK Biobank. We limited the UK Biobank to just have the same number of SNPs or the same exact SNPs that were in the Framingham Heart Study. So we can kind of compare and contrast of like uh, replicability. Uh, here we have 6,000, 7,000 individuals for Framingham Heart Study and 10,000 European ancestry in the UK Biobank. Uh, as a subset, um, we we look at eighteen thousand or so uh, SNP sets or genes and intergenic regions across the genome, and then we're just going to focus again on HDL. Um, and so here, this this is a nice depiction of kind of the results I was kind of talking about in a in a uh, fully Bayesian model. What you would kind of see are nice spikes happen along the genome, and here you can see certain representatives be chosen right along the genome. And this is a, I think this is a consequence of the variational EM algorithm itself and finding like these approximate sparse um, approximations. And so here you have certain things. Uh, SUSY is another model uh, by Matthew Stevens group and so is RSS. And you can see how there are certain replications that we find both that uh, we ran in their models also these data. And you can see uh, there, uh, there's a table in the paper that kind of show, show nice uh, um, agreement between all these different methods. Um, so um, just as so I really quickly go over like some stuff that's going on in my lab and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, some ongoing work for my group is, uh, you know, further developing these effect size analogs to better take account of like interactions between features for the GP idea. The other thing that we're do doing is extending bands to multi-omic data sources. Um, I think I was talking to Nancy about this earlier. Another thing that is, that is um, interesting about bands is the way you define your annotations has a huge implication of how well this model is going to work. So, um, you know, we focus on just genes, which is a which is a really nice thing because um, gene sets there's not a lot of correlation or overlap between them. If you have annotations such as pathways where there are large overlaps between these annotations of between pathways, um, there could be identifiability issues that happen in terms of discriminating what's going on between us, what, what information is stored in one hidden layer node versus the other. Right. And so what bands, again, is going to do with highly correlated um, annotations, again, choose the one according to how its variational EM is currently set up. So that's, again, that's another thing to kind of think about. Um, the other thing that my group has been doing is using machine learning um, and these kind of nonlinear association mapping things for things not in genetics per se, but the things focus more on like imaging and shapes. So at the bottom here, you see a glioblastoma uh, um, representation of a, of a mesh. Uh, where uh, this is derived from patients in the TCGA where we took their MRI scans and ran them through a convolution neural network to create this mesh type architecture. And, and the question I've been asking here is where you can probe whether shape variation is correlated with genotypic or phenotypic variation. And so here we use a lot of the GP rate ideas to do what we call association mapping on 3D surfaces. 
Um, and so just as a quick example, as a quick plug for the stuff we have going on, um, this is what we call the Sinatra pipeline. Where Sinatra is really interesting, you take shapes from two different groups. So you can think about this is an example of teeth from two different primates. Um, what we do is we create these topological summary statistics of them. So we take shapes and, and transform them into really nice curves. Um, and so we have a bunch of curves for, let's say, a car set of carnivores and a set of herbivores. And what you can do is you can run Gaussian processes on them and identify using rate what areas of these curves most best identify or best correspond to the variation between these two groups, right? Um, and then what's really nice about the, the transformation from shape to uh, summary statistic is it's invertible. So I can take those pieces of, of the curves that are most important according to the GP and map them back onto the shape of interest. And so on the right-hand side, you're seeing the physical features that separate what, uh, what, is, what makes up a tooth of a carnivore and what separates that from a tooth of a herbivore. Um, you can do this in a myriad of different spaces. You can do this with proteins as well. Let's say I have a wild type and a mutant and I want to understand which structural themes are different. You can, you can have a pipeline also does that. Um, and so we're using this kind of like non-parametric, non-additive variable selection techniques in a, in a, in a bunch of different areas, in, uh, uh, broadly speaking, the biomedical sciences, which has been pretty fun. Um, with that, because I know I probably spoke way too much, uh, I just want to say this is a huge collaborative effort across many different groups, many different labs, um, and people have been nice enough to give us money and I'm really appreciative of that and um, with the support of, of um, different students and things like that. So that's been really helpful. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, here's some relevant resources in case anybody's interested. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that awesome talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute or um, put your questions into the chat. Yeah, I have one. Uh, my name is Darko Stefanovsky, coming from the School of Veterinary Medicine. Great talk. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. I just wanted to touch briefly on the Manhattan plot. So in the Manhattan plots, we're showing the log of the p-values. Mm -hmm. But as we discussed, we, we were talking about the beds in the identification of quantification of the relationship between these traits and the, and the outcome and the uh, specific uh, loci. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, uh, just briefly on that topic is that do you actually have good identification of that relation together with the probability of how relevant it is uh, from these models, the band models. From, from the, from the, sorry, which, which uh, from any of the Manhattan plots or just the mice examples specifically? Well, right, the, the Manhattan plots are just holding the p-values right. and the band approach was, was supposed to uh, give us an approximation of the estimated beds. Right, 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 right. So I was just wondering, you, we didn't see the betas, but how how well do they relate, uh, basically, in your experience? How oh, well oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, they, they do a good job of identifying. Okay, so um, what bands will do is you'll find, um, you'll identify a subset of inclusion probabilities that maybe, say, the full Bayesian model would have found, right? So what it'll do is it's going to identify uh, an inclusion probability um, or estimate inclusion probability with that EM that is uh, for for a few SNPs that are uh, that are that are, that a fully model would have found, um, and then it's going to say that the other ones are set to zero or close to zero, right? So it's going to find a few. It's, it's a it's a it's a byproduct of that approximation. You're going to find a few of those traits that are that are that are a few of those SNPs that you would have found with the full model. What we what we argue in the paper is. Um, of the, the power to identify the genes that matter. So this idea of, I, I find a few SNPs maybe, but I'm going to, um, I have a lot of power to identify the genes that a fully Bayesian whatever model would have found for which then you could do follow-up analyses with, right? And so that the power to identify um, uh, uh, genes that are related to mechanisms related to the traits is, is actually quite robust. Us that we that we found in the paper, um, but there is going to be an underestimation for the SNPs because of that correlation structure that I was mentioning before. Thank you. Yeah.
No, thanks for your question. How's it going? Hi, Laura. Here's Hi. Nancy again. Hi. I have another question about the um, uh, the GWAS uh, the network. Mm -hmm. um, how about those SNPs that lie in non-coding regions that you cannot assign to genes? What do you do with those? Right. So in our paper, this is a really good question. So in our paper, we um, treated those as like these like um, intergenic regions between just we 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 group genes that weren't necessarily assigned to a gene um, as like kind of like these gene desert regions that we also include as their own SNP set. Um, there were a few, one of my, one of our viewers, I strictly remember asking or saying that we should think about, we didn't include in the paper, the editor didn't make us, but this idea of inclu including many different types of annotations as well. So thinking about different types of, uh, you know, you think about like L LD score kind of can do, think about many different annotations and fitting that into the model. Vans is flexible enough to do that. Um, we didn't do that. I think we just, we had exhausted all of the things that we could do for genes. And so adding on top of that was, was quite a bit for this particular paper. Um, but so for this paper, what you'll see is we'll treat those as what we call these intergenic or gene desert type of things. And then, um, but in, in reality, you, could, you can think about how to, how to group those however you want. What bands does as a software is it just needs for you to specify how things should be annotated, and then and then it will make those partial connections for you uh, via this via this mask. And so you're you have the flexibility to define those how you, how you want. I see. It's really cool. Thanks. Yeah. No thanks. I had a question about the bands and kind of how you're expanding some of your approaches to um, more multi-omic data. I guess I, I understand um, kind of the gap that would fill, but also just wanted to know maybe from the perspective of this particular software, what challenges you see or um, where uh, there could be even more like improvement. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there are a few. Okay, so in when you move to the omic setting, um, the first thing is if you're doing this in bulk, thinking about small data challenges, right? Mm -hmm. So what we rely on and what you'll see in that paper is we never consider sample sizes smaller than 10,000 individuals. So if you think about mm -hmm. running this on multi omics data with small n, the variation of EM is probably not the algorithm that you want to run it with. You probably want to think mm -hmm. about a whole other algorithmic setup for it. The other thing that's interesting about multi-omics is um, you could, I think I was talking to Nancy about this as well, you could think of, you could think about this, this setting where I group multiple measurements for a given gene together or a given cell or whatever together and then, and then kind of do it in this kind of way. Another thing that we've been thinking about is thinking about how to take advantage of like the hierarchical nature of a cell and thinking mm -hmm. about how to introduce um, new omic measurements at different portions of the model. So, you know, you, you think about um, starting with gene expression and you think about introducing chromatin things down the line, proteomics things maybe further in the model and having like a hierarchical nature model set up there where you introduce um, new omic measurements when they're relevant according to the architecture that you're trying to take advantage of across the cell. Um, so that challenge come, becomes like, how do, you, how do you do that? So I think there's, there's this argument of, that we've been fighting with in that space of how to, um, uh, how and when to, to group data types together, um, which yeah. has been quite interesting. And then for this, you know, same thing can happen for single cell. Like, let's say you have cell measurements um, that, you know, single cell, you might be able to think, think about large data, um, but let's say your different omics are coming from different cells, maybe from the same cell type. Like, how do I think about that? So there, there's some interesting questions there that um, we haven't fleshed out at all, but we're happy to talk about. Great. Um, a question from Pavel um, wants to know if you could comment on uh, to what degree the non-additive slash interactive interaction terms 
um, are statistical rather than biological. For example, using all variables can potentially provide even better prediction, but are these n-way interactions biologically meaningful? Yeah, that was a really good question. Um, so uh, it depends on the phenotype of interest. So for instance, if I were to, uh, for certain traits, right? Um, and, what we, and what we've seen a little bit in some other studies is for certain populations of people um, where the neural network or, or a non-additive model may not mean so much if I look at a certain trait for certain groups of people, um, but it might mean a lot for other groups of, of individuals, um, both in terms of statistical power as well as like uh, predictions and association mapping things and things like that. Um, for expression traits, which is where we focused a lot on things for um, these non-additive mapping studies that we've done in the past, um, there are actually biological significance things that, that actually pop up there. Um, for omic-based studies, we've also seen obviously interactions between pathways and genes mean a lot in terms of explaining um, uh, you know, variation for certain uh, uh, phenotypes uh, in, in genomics. But in, in, in the GWAS setting, it definitely depends on um, the trait of interest and the population for which we're actually studying, um, you know, these traits within. Well, thank you. I think we'll wrap up, uh, right, Carlos? Um, so yes. for the students, yes. we'll have our uh, meeting with Dr. Crawford after, after this, but I uh, just want to thank you again for your time and a really great presentation. Uh, learned a lot today, and I, I know this was beneficial to some. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.